so w whatever the human project is, given our scientific knowledge of um, the birth of the universe, we have to factor in this celebratory element, this sort of spontaneous, joyous uh, eruption of, of harmonious movement and rhythm. You know, the, the whole universe is singing the same song with the same underlying fundamental notes. Uh, we call them physical constants, right? They're mathematical, but really they're musical. Um, the, the cosmos of, of modern science is actually rather similar to Pythagoras and Plato, you know, to, to the kind of universe that Plato was writing about in, in the Timaeus um, than, than the modern scientific images of a giant clockwork machine, you know, invented by nobody for no reason. I think the scientific image of the universe is, as Corey said, it's already, uh, it's quantum, it's complex, uh, it's holistic. It's it's a vision of the universe uh, as a relationship among organisms. Um, certainly, this is how someone like uh, Alpha North Whitehead, who wrote uh, many books, perhaps the most accessible of which is Science in the Modern World. Um, Whitehead began to think uh, as a, as a mathematical physicist. Um, he, he began to think about the quantum and relativistic revolutions in the early 20th, 20th century uh, as indications that the universe was more like a living creature than uh, a machine where the parts exist externally to other parts um, and where material bodies have simple location and can be defined uh, by the substance that which composes them rather than being in... Um, be having its uh, essence to to be its relationships to other other entities in the region. Um, Whitehead discovered that the the, the cosmos and certainly the Earth uh, is alive in some sense. He, he was a panpsychist and. Uh, he was very aware to uh, aware of and um, hip to the trajectory of modern industrial consumer capitalism. He was aware of also the potential for science to degenerate into a collection of ad hoc hypotheses if it failed to pay attention to philosophy, to tr traditional questions of philosophy, traditional questions about meaning, about value, about beauty, love, freedom, uh, and questions about wisdom. Corey referred to a sort of mundane meaning. And I, by that, you know, mundane, I think, comes from Latin meaning um, mundus, world. So it's a meaning that we find in the world rather than transcendent to the world. Uh, he wants us to open to history, to remember um, you know, he wants us to treat learning as a way of life, right? That, that, and I think that really is the philosopher's dream. Uh, the perfect society would be that in which learning was the, the end goal, right? Not profit, not comfort even, but wisdom scholarship, which is a sort of, um, it comes uh, from Latin again, scolia, which I, th I think, you know, has, has some relation to play, to, to playfulness, to leisure, uh, and having the, the relaxed um, uh, time, uh, the time off, in order to play and to, to learn through curiosity and wonder, rather than through um, you know, necessity and demand uh, for survival, a kind of biological learning, which is certainly important, but there's a, there's a form of learning that the human species seems uniquely um, excellent at, uh, at least on this planet. Um, and it's, it's a cultural learning, right? And I think uh, Corey is dead on 
I guess all that I would want to add is that uh, there is a way in which the world is conditioned by uh, something beyond it, something transcendent to it. And I wouldn't want to pretend like uh, traditional religion, as as we, we call it in the modern period, as, as we're, we're distant from it and can observe it from the outside. Traditional religion isn't entirely to be thrown out, I think. And it, it has to do with how we relate to the transcendent. You know, there's something valuable about, you know, the, the Abrahamic traditions, for example, and about the um, the Vedic traditions and, uh, you know, on into to Buddhism later, that has to do with transcendence, right? I think, really, I would want to talk about the axial uh, age that uh, Carl Jaspers wrote about and that um, more contemporary thinkers like Robert Bella uh, are continuing to write about. Um, the axial age brought this revelation of some transcendent uh, orientation, right, of a, of a mono, monotheistic um, divinity, or at least of um, a, a kind of freedom that can be reached through love of uh, this, this greater something, right? So, uh, granted, there are schools of Buddhism that are not... Uh, theistic in any way, so the, the axial isn't always just theistic, but uh, the way that um, you know, the, the Buddhists started in, in subsequent centuries to talk about, you know, um, Buddha nature, I think quickly becomes um, consonant with forms of mystical theism. Um, but anyways, the point is, transcendence is still a live option. Thinking the relationship between uh, finitude and and infinitude, or between immanence and transcendence, is still a valid pursuit. I think I, you know I I still want to be able to do theology, in some sense of that term. Um, you know, and maybe I'll post a link to an example of of what that looks like for me. But I also wanted to leave you all uh, with. Um, an excerpt from a, uh, a text by the philosopher of history, Eric Vogelin. Um, he wrote uh, many books, including a multi-volume uh, collection called uh, Order and History. And one of the volumes was on Plato and Aristotle, and in the context of a discussion of the Phaedrus and the way in which wisdom, the wisdom of the soul, cannot be written down um, as some teachable doctrine. It, it can't be codified into the dead letter of the written word. Uh, and v Vogelin writes, um, the idea word, idea hyphen word, which is his translation of um, uh, to idotos logos in, in Greek, um, the idea word is the medium in which the tenderness and strength of eros Greek for love, expresses itself. So the idea word is the medium in which the tenderness and strength of Eros expresses itself. The idea word is the vehicle of communication by means of which erotic souls attune one another to the harmony of the cosmos. And the idea word is the fragile vessel in which the God becomes incarnate in community. So the idea word, it's, it's the wisdom lying dormant in the soul that can be brought out through the process of padea, of, of learning. Um, and what, what Vogelin is pointing to is that every society finds its point of orientation through it. This, um, the entrance of something transcendent, the incarnation of something transcendent, into into the community, right? Into this this fragile um, matrix or, or womb of interrelationship among among individuals, um, and 
this idea of incarnation, I think, you know, we know it's been very powerful in especially European history. It's, it's led to um, everything from uh, crusades uh, and inquisitions to uh, civil rights movements and the abolition of slavery. Um, you know, it's been used as a, as a symbol that, that transforms um, the, the assumptions of, of the social order uh, in many ways. With, it's been given many meanings. But clearly it's powerful and it's kind of, it's the archetype we have to work with or the archetype that's working with us, whether we like it or not. Um, so, food for thought. Uh, thanks very much to Corey uh, for, for getting me thinking about these things. Um, and thanks for listening.